Hello. Yeah, I changed my talk, so forget what's written in the thing. Forget those muons. It's now called the Ear Witness Inventory. I'm going to speak about this um, inventory of objects that I've been uh, amassing. And um, I would like to start by saying thank you very much to Inti and uh, Cosmin and Celia and everyone at Parasite. Um, and everyone who, who spoke at this conference, it's been great to meet you and hear your presentations. Before you start, yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I started. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to change your talk again? No. Yeah, I'm changing. <laughs> uh, no, just um, to inform you that we will not have a break before Natasha's talk, but we're going to go straight. So we're going to do three presentations then a break, and then the plenary discussion. So, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, yeah, and as Inti mentioned, I'm an artist and private ear, and sometimes those worlds are separate, and sometimes they meet. And one of the projects I'm gonna be talking about now, so private ear is like an independent audio investigator, right? Private eye, private ear. So, um, um, and uh, I have been, for a long time, fascinated by ear witness testimony in, that, in both those capacities. And ear witness testimony is actually one of the most uh, prolific sources of testimony. Why? Because of the sort of physical logics of sound, right? In the sense that many international cases have hinged on sounds that witnesses have heard much more than eyewitness testimony, right? Because Often people aren't actually looking at something when it happens, or you know, crimes are meant by design to happen out of sight, but often leak into the sort of uh, spaces in which people are living, through walls, through windows, and those end up becoming um, testimonies. So, um, you know, if we look at, think about the most famous recent trials like um, uh, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, um, uh, Oscar Pistorius. Um, who else did heinous thing uh, died or did heinous thing? Uh, anyway, any any of the ones you can think of recently, and um, I don't think, and I hope you will agree with me by the end of this presentation, that it's a coincidence that in each of those cases, actually, um, the perpetrator, murderers of Michael Brown, murderers of Trayvon Martin, got off scot free when sound was at stake and sound was being discussed. Right. So. Um, there's a lack of ability to speak about it, and I think that's one of the problems, uh, ability to solicit it and to speak about it. And um, so before I kind of um, do, the, do the presentation, I just wanted to say a little bit about how this whole thing came about, because it's important. In 2013, I was on residency in Sweden at the Jaspis, and I went to the Swedish radio theater um, and at the time, I had been looking into uh, the role that ear witness testimony could play in uh, locating uh, black sites, CIA black sites, because no one had seen them, they'd only heard them, right? So a lot of the witness testimony of people who were in uh, CIA black sites were audio. And um, uh, I went to the Swedish radio theater, and there it's incredible. So every floor surface is divided into uh, different surfaces to make different sounds. The staircases are divided, there's door instruments, the walls contract and expand, and you can basically create any sort of space there. And it's a space made for illusion, but what occurred to me is the work of Foley artists, sound effects artists, could actually be used paradoxically not as a thing to produce illusion and to imitate space, but also to, to, to kind of like as a mode of truth production, actually to uncover and reenact events and uh, solicit ear witness testimony. So I began thinking about ways that uh, to use the Swedish radio theater and to use the Swedish radio to do a project uh, doing the uh, uh, excavation of CIA black sites with former witnesses and we got very far. And then in 2014, the US Senate report released its huge documents basically outlining where those black sites were. So the project was shelved for the better. That information did come to light eventually. Um, and uh, then, two years later, I start working on something totally else. Um, I am approached by, through Forensic Architecture, a, a research agency at Goldsmiths University, um, 
on behalf of Amnesty International uh, to investigate a prison in Syria, Said Naya it's called. And this prison, just like the CIA black sites, had been a place where um, people were brought in blindfolded and had only really heard what was going on around them. Uh, we knew where the prison was, so it wasn't a question of locating it in space, but it was a question of, um, uh, for my part of the investigation, it was about um, designing dedicated ear witness interviews that could solicit and kind of prompt the memories of those uh, people who were there. Um, and uh, yeah, Saidnaya is, is essentially a concentration camp. Um, uh, around 17,000 people are estimated to have, to have been killed there since 2011. Um, and uh, so what they heard pertained to war crimes, essentially, um, and, and building a case towards uh, the analysis of war crimes. Um, uh, I'm not going to be talking about that place today. If you want to look at the findings that we did with Amnesty International, that's all online, that was published, that was part of a huge campaign in 2016. Elements of the prison are going to be appearing here. Um, but what I'm going to be speaking about is how that process um, basically uh, compelled me to actually think properly about working with uh, the relation between Foley um, and sound effects to actually solicit uh, acoustic uh, testimony. And, and the way it worked in that process was me playing back sounds from Warner Brothers and BBC uh, libraries. But in fact, what I think I need to do after that investigation was actually create my own sound effects library that's specific to the soliciting of ear witness testimony. And so what I began to do is researching ear witness testimony. So after the Saidnaya interviews in, in 2016, I began looking at ear witness testimony from across the globe, scouring trial transcripts to see if the things that occurred to me through making the Saidnaya investigation were also present in lives of people outside of that prison in totally other contexts. Um, so rather than talk about that prison alone, this talk in the context of what to let go is about the ways in which those interviews that I did in 2016 changed the fundamental ways in which I thought about acoustic memory and the way sound, uh, which is often thought to be ephemeral and brief, is actually something that becomes deeply etched into our cortex in, in unexpected ways. So. What you're going to hear in this selection of objects, my own personal sound effects library, which I'm going to um, uh, show today, uh, is that um, some of those objects pertain to specific forensic reenactment of crimes, so scientific-ish reenactment of crimes, in order to understand the sonic constitution of an event. But others in the collection sit side by side, pertain to an ineffability and an almost hallucinogenic way in which lived events become tethered to and embedded in the objects we are surrounded by. So I'm going to move through the list. It's 95 objects. I'm going to move through them uh, al alphabetically. And then I'm going to elaborate on a selection of them in the form of a small, um, uh, small independent and trans-historical vignettes that together represent the collection as a whole. And that collection, this inventory, stands for a language that we do not yet speak, essentially, because as I said, there's this lack of vocabulary in speaking about sound. It sort of goes beyond language in many ways, or demand new forms of language. So it's a language we do not yet speak, and it's a language of and between objects in many of the ways we've heard for example, Pablo speak about and, and other people. And I will hope that this presentation of my ear witness inventory will prove what Marianne Pasta Roca said yesterday, that inventories can be really rather nice things to think about, both for the purposes of measuring entanglements and lacuna in the way she was doing. So, here goes nothing. Aluminium stepladder, army boots, bag of sand, bag of soil, bananas, Blackberry Curve 2011. Brogues, cannelloni pasta, cauliflower, car door instrument, celery, cigarette lighter, cinder block, coins, cornstarch, cotton clothing, cricket bat, crocs, cuckoo call, whistle, cucumbers, curlew and peewit call, Dell keyboard 2006, dove and pigeon call, whistle, eggs, empty cans, family size soft drink bottles, fiberglass sledgehammer, flip flops, frog guiros, galvanized dustbin, 
Uh, goalkeeper gloves, granite stone tile, green coconut, ice cream truck music box, inflatable pool, iPhone 5C, iron building bar, junior punching bag, chibiz, Arabic bread, chibiz, dried, fried, latex balloons, leather belt with metal buckle, leather handbag, marble stone tiles, megaphone, 60 watt, metal door instrument with fold-out scissor slide feature, metal vat, mosquito killer lamp, nightingale call, Nokia RM908 cell phone, Ostrich feather duster, parabolic dish, pine cones, plastic bags, popcorn maker, popcorn seeds, porcelain Arabic coffee cups, portobello, potato crisps, chips, rug, Russian roulette balloon gun, sesame seeds, silver foil helium, helium balloon, slingshot, sneakers, steel wool, stilettos, sunflower seeds, tissue box, tomatoes, to Toyota Land Cruiser car horn, train whistle, tray rack trays, unwound videotapes, ventilation duct cover, wagon wheel, water supply piping, al Akhtar Brahimi, watermelon, Wicker carpet beater, willow cane, wooden steps, half carpeted, wooden door instrument, wooden planks, woolen mattress topper, yard chain, yellow pages. Aluminium stepladder, army boots, bag of sand, bag of soil, bananas, blackberry curve 2011, brogues, cannelloni pasta. So these pasta, are uh, uh, all objects that are derived letter, specifically pedagogue, from points, legal cases cotton clothing, cricket bat, that props, I've been researching. Each one of them pertains to a different case, and I'm going to speak to a couple of those now. Some of the objects are sourced, and some of them I've created myself. Aluminium stepladder. Gloves. The metallic staircase leading to the guards room in the central atrium of Saidnaya prison became one of the ways that we could try to approximate in which area of the prison former detainees had been held. The witnesses I interviewed never saw this staircase, but they heard the resonant metallic tongue of the guards ascending or descending the steps countless times throughout the course of a day. It, it was during my interview with Salam that it first occurred to me that I could try to use this sound as a way to locate his cell and therefore determine from what perspective and proximity he could have heard other sounds in the prison. In the middle of the interview, I flipped open my laptop and typed Metal Stairs into a search engine for the Warner Brothers and BBC sound effects libraries. 245 entries appeared. I quickly scanned the list. Footstep, metal stairs, cross-country ski boot, leather, no ski, right step, low resonant metal stair. A body fall falling down and flight of metal stairs. Metal stairs, women's thin high heel shoes, fast steps. Then it jumped out at me. Footsteps, metal, male, sneakers, upstairs. I booted up the file and played it for Salam. Salam tilted his head, paused, and then he said it was too forceful and too loud, but that the essence of the metallic impact was similar. I lowered the volume and added a reverb to soften it, making it appear more distant. He seemed a little more satisfied. And we both put on headphones and I asked him to imagine that he was sitting in his cell facing the door. And I told him that I was going to move the sound from left to right and that he should signal to me when he got to the position he remembered it coming from. He closed his eyes. I looped the sound and slowly panned it across the stereo field. Increments before I reached the furthest right position of the pan control, he raises the hand to stop me. The needle of this sonic compass was pointing northwest. Latex balloons, leather belt with metal buckle, leather handbag, marble stone tiles, megaphone, 60 watts. Coins. Dear Dr. French, I have a question for you as a case I'm currently working on that has to do with the killing of an unarmed Palestinian protester, Bassam Abu Rahme. He was hit in a chest by a tear gas canister. The Israeli Defense Force have claimed that the canister was not fired directly at Bassam, but rather that it ricocheted off the separation fence that was directed and, and was directed towards him. I can't hear any ricochet sound in the videos, but what kind of sound should I be listening for? I will not be able to get the equipment to stage a reenactment for this for obvious reasons, though some preliminary research has shown that the sound of ricochet in movies are made by firing a coin in a slingshot. Thanks a great deal for your help with this, Lawrence. Woolen mattress topper, yard chain, yellow pages. Aluminium step ladder. Cricket bats. The trial of the athlete Oscar Pistorius was dedicated to discovering if he had intended to shoot Riva Steenkamp through the bathroom wall or if, as Pistorius claimed, he had in fact believed that he was shooting an, unarm an armed intruder behind the bathroom door. Ear witnesses living in neighboring compounds said they heard voices shouting and arguing before hearing gunfire. Pistorius testified that after he realized that it was Steenkamp that he had shot by accident, he screamed in panic and grabbed a cricket bat to smash through the locked door. 
During the cross-examination of, of the ear witnesses to the crime, a replica of the bathroom door was brought into the courtroom, and a forensic audio expert, armed with a cricket bat, began to beat it many times. This clamor was made to demonstrate that a cricket bat striking a wooden door could produce a deafening sound as intense as the blast of a gunshot. The cricket bat blast punctuated a line of questioning that sought to place a seed of doubt in the ears of the witnesses. Had they heard Steenkamp's shouts followed by gunfire or Pistorius' scream followed by the sound of a cricket bat striking a door? This demonstration turned the courtroom into a makeshift sound effects studio and the expert witness into a Foley artist. Though his performance was billed as a forensic reenactment, what it actually achieved was a demonstration of the deceitful and illusory nature of sound, where clearly distinct and conventionally unassociated objects, like guns and cricket bats, become interchangeable and indistinguishable. Pages. Aluminium stepladder, army boots, bag of sand, bag of soil, bananas, blackberry curve 2011, brogues, cannelloni pasta, cauliflower, cardo and... Green coconuts. The sound effects in wildlife documentaries are extremely over the top. The loud slurp of a polar bear licking its paw has always removed me from the Arctic Circle and brought me to imagine some human in a dim, echoless basement recording studio, surrounded by peculiar objects in which they endlessly flick, flail, brush, strike, and squeeze into microphones. Paradoxically, I rarely ever wonder about the labor of the sound effects artists in works of pure fiction like Game of Thrones. By the way, admitting to the art world that you watch Game of Thrones is a kind of career suicide. But I will continue. I only, um, I only learned quite lately that in this show, uh, Game of Thrones, they use green coconuts to create the sounds of all of their decapitations. As many, as have never, as many of us have never heard a real decapitation, I think that green coconuts now sound more like human heads to us than human heads actually do. Meaning that if we were able to hear a human's head instead of a green coconut, we may not be so convinced. Whereas we know that the scaly skin of an iguana squirming up a rock does not sound like he's wearing a pair of leather sweatpants. There was, however, one scene in Game of Thrones in which the sound effects did shatter my suspension of disbelief. It was not the rattling growl of a dragon or the stomps of a giant ice zombie which brought me hurtling back down to earth but rather the very simple gesture of one character closing a door. As I heard this door shut, I had an acoustic flashback. I had heard that exact sound somewhere before. It was in fact the same stock door closing track that I had played to Jamal from the Warner Brothers Sound Library during the investigation into Saidnaya Prison some three months earlier. This was enough to completely uncouple the sound from the images in the TV show and transport me back to the moment in the interview. Lawrence, is this the sound of the door? Plays door sound. Jamal, no, it was more metallic sound. Maybe if we watch a film where a prison door gets closed, you get the sound I'm talking about. Lawrence, what about this one? Plays door sound option two, the one later heard in Game of Thrones. Jamal, it's close, but it's not quite right. I know where we can find the exact sound. After I got released from Saidnaya, I became a refugee in Turkey and was looking for an apartment in Istanbul. I visited an apartment located on the top floor of a building, and the apartment had a metal door so that burglars wouldn't break in. That metal door made the exact same sound as the one I was telling you about from Saidnaya. As soon as the door opened, I instantly told the guy, I cannot live in this apartment. It made the exact same sound. If we had time today, I would take you there so that you could hear the cell doors of Saidnaya. Tish tak. Wagon wheel, water supply piping, al Ibrahimi, watermelon. Wicker carpet beater, willow cane, wooden steps, half carpeted, wooden door instrument, wooden planks, woolen mattress topper, yard chain, yellow pages. Ice cream truck music box. On January 17, 2005, Fabian Bengston, a Swedish electronics executive, was kidnapped and kept in a narrow wooden case for 17 days before he was released. Bengston never saw his kidnappers or the place he was held, but the sound of the assailant's voices leaked through the walls of the wooden box along with other acoustic signifiers. Most importantly for the subsequent police investigation, Bankston had mentioned what time the jingling song of an ice cream truck passed by on the street outside every morning. This information was key in enabling investigators to find the apartment where he had been held, and so to locate and convict the kidnappers. The story, which was widely circulated at the time by Swedish news agencies, 
caught the ears of Anders Ericsson, a forensic phonetician at the University of Gothenburg, and his student, Lisa Oman. They realized that although countless experimental studies had been conducted into the veracity of eyewitness testimony, there was very re little research into the re in relation to the memories of ear witnesses. This motivated them to conduct a major study in the reliability of auditory memories. They tested a total of 949 people's ability to blindly identify human voices. Yet their decision to focus only on human voice recognition means that to this day there is still no major study of ear witness memories of non-voice based acoustic stimuli. Watermelon, wicker carpet beater, willow cane, wooden steps, half carpeted, wooden door instrument, wooden planks, Woolen mattress topper, yard chain. When asked by her grandchildren to relay the memories, sorry, this is Junior Punching Bag. Junior Punching Bag. When asked by her grandchildren to relay the memories of the genocide in Congo some 50 years earlier, a survivor began, I remember hearing the first Belgian steamboats arriving like the noise of the large wind that precedes rain. And in fact, wind is incredibly hard to audio record and accurately reproduce. If a microphone is exposed to accelerated air movements, it overloads the diaphragm inside and produces a distorted crackling. This is why when we hear the sound of wind in films and television, it is rarely ever a, w a recording of actual wind. For years, the go-to means to make the sound of a wind was a purpose-built cylindrical instrument that as it rotates, it scrapes a sheet of canvas across wooden slats. However, when making Wally, the Wall E, you know, Wall E, the film with the robot. Veteran sound designer Ben Burt felt that the wind sound produced in this way was too sharp and thin, and so he set about trying to build a new instrument until he discovered that he could create a very convincing wind sound by dragging a punching bag across a carpeted floor. In 2008, his technique set a new precedent for the production of wind sound. So off, more often now we're hearing a punching bag being dragged on carpeted floor. And this sound combines the wind's whistle with the undulating bass hum that precedes rain. This is Ben Burt's quote. Khibiz, Arabic bread. While we were attempting to reconstruct the sound of the door to Samar's wing in Saidnaya, I began playing him filmic sound effects of metal doors. But none of the door sounds I played satisfied Samar's acoustic memory, and he kept telling me to raise the volume. The sounds were getting louder and louder until finally I played him the sound of a huge metal door slamming with the reverb set to Notre Dame Cathedral. That is to say, a vast cavernous space with a 35 meter high ceiling as opposed to the 4 meter high ceiling of the actual space in question. Upon hearing this vast sound, Samuel was taken aback. He stopped me and said, this sound was present in Saidnaya. This was the exact sound, not of the door, but of the sound of sheets of bread being dropped to the ground outside my cell. From the weight of the sound, I could tell if it was 5, 8, 10, or 20 sheets." End quote. Sometime after the interview, I conducted a test, dropping packs of Arabic bread to the ground, which confirmed to me that which is written into the laws of physics. That is, that even 20 sheets of Arabic bread landing on the ground could not make such a vast sound. However, it was not the laws of physics that were at work here. Samus' complete conviction that this was the exact sound of food arriving made me understand that we were not talking about the intensity of sound, but inadvertently, the intensity of hunger. Though this did not get me closer to understanding the architecture of the prison, it offered a rare glimpse into the way that starvation distorts the senses. Khibiz, dried, fried. Lawrence, which sounds of the prison do you remember hearing the most? Anas, I remember the most the constant sound of diggers digging. It stuck with me because I don't know exactly what they were digging. Graves? Lawrence. Diggers? Like a JCB digger truck? Digging into the ground? Anas. Yes. It's the sound I remember most. All you hear is diggers digging. You feel like they're working on something, but you're unable to figure out what it is. Lawrence. Well, what did it sound like exactly? Anas. Like people were breaking dried out bread. Although we never had any bread to eat anyway. We were starved. Lawrence. So it sounded like somebody constantly breaking dried bread? Anas. Yeah, that's what I remember hearing all the time. Granite stone tile, green coconut, ice cream truck, music box, inflatable pool, iPhone 5C, iron building bar, junior punching bag, chiviz, Arabic bread. Metal door instrument with fold out scissor slide feature. So one of the main things in, in this collection of objects is actually my uh, 
designing of a series of door instruments. And doors are extremely important in the Saidnaya case for, 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 for reasons I will now explain. But they're also extremely important. Uh, they punctuate many different ear witness testimonies across the globe. And so it was important for me to create specific door instruments that could be played exactly the conditions that we need and could meet many of the different conditions. So they're full of locks and different bolts and have the possibility to make many different door sounds than just the one door that, um, that open and close. There exist many historical cases of the sound of doors and locks being embedded as part of the torture process. Basque, tortured by the Spanish, describe El Cerrojo, I'm sorry, everyone, uh, for the pronunciation. El Cerrojo as one of the most terrifying and damaging acts. That is, the rapid and repeated bolting and unbolting of the door in order to keep them in a state of anticipation of torture. Alexander Solzhenitsyn's account of the Soviet gulag describe how in Russia, guards were trained to slam the door in a jarring way as possible or to close it in an equally unnerving silence. So you understand that the performance of the door as an instrument is in, has been an integral part of um, torture. The doors inside Naya prison had a similar effect on its survivors, and Diab explained to me that the sound is impossible to erase from one's memory. However, the sound of the doors was not only used to spread fear, Salam and others used it like a sonar or an echolocation device that helped him and his fellow detainees locate the position of the guards. And Salam's comprehensive account of the sound of the cell doors allowed us to approximate how many cells were in use in his wing and was one of the many details that made it possible for Amnesty to estimate how many prisoners were being incarcerated at the time in Saidnaya prison. So this is the quote from Salam. Salam, every cell door, and there were 10 cells in our wing, had a unique sound. And that what we would do is memorize those sounds to know which cell door was being opened. I memorized them in sequence first. So for example, the guards would open the first cell door and we'd say, that is the sound of door number one. Then we'd memorize the way the next door sounded different to the first door, and so on and so on. After some time, we would know the distinct sound of each door. So if the guards would open a door randomly, we'd know, for example, it is door number three because of a particular squeak of the hinges or the tack sound it would release from the lock. Some doors make harsh sounds, others softer sounds. Some have specifically rusted locks, you know. Each door had its own characteristic. The guards would try to use the door sounds to make you think there is more than one of them patrolling the corridor at a time. He didn't want to give us the impression that he is alone, and so as each door had three different locks, he would open two of the locks at once, simultaneously, to make it seem that two different cell doors are being opened by two different guards at the same time. He would always think he would succeed in deceiving us, but we were onto them. Leather belt with metal buckle, leather handbag, marble stone tiles, megaphone, 60 watts, metal door instrument with fold-out scissor slide feature, metal vat, mosquito killer lamp, nightingale call, Nokia... Popcorn maker. At 9.30 on August 13, 2013, a guest at a Florida resort was falling asleep after a long day at Walt Disney World. As she was drifting off, she was disturbed by what sounded like popcorn. These were the early warning sounds that an hour later the resort would collapse into a 100-foot-wide sinkhole. Russian roulette balloon gun. In an internet cafe in Kassel, Germany, on April 6, 2006, Halit Yozgat was shot dead by neo-Nazis armed with a suppressed CZ-83 concealed in a plastic bag. There were no eyewitnesses to the murder. However, all of the customers in the cafe heard some loud percussive sounds. One witness said, I heard three sounds, three times it went tack, 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 one after the other, as if somebody was knocking on the walls of the room. Another witness described a sound that was very loud as if something had fallen on the ground. The closest witness, the closest witness to the incident said, I heard something like a balloon exploding. One of the witness claimed, no, only one of the witness claimed that he didn't hear any exceptional noises, it's a quote, any exceptional noises, and that was Andreas Temma, an intelligence agent who did, not disclose his pres who did not disclose his presence to the police at the time of the murder until he was identified by his login data on one of the cafe's computers later. This sparked suspicions that a possible collusion between the agent and the neo-Nazis and the case began to resemble that of Sherlock Holmes's curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. 
in which not one of the ear witnesses to a horse race robbery remembered hearing the guard dog bark, leading Holmes to investigate whether the thief was someone the dog knew. For is it possible that one could fail to hear a balloon popping from 10 meters away? Could Teme's own keystrokes on a 2006 model Dell keyboard really have been so loud as to drown out the sound of a gunshot? Is Teme the dog that didn't bark? Sesame seeds. Such absences and ellipses in testimony as Holmes identifies can be just as meaningful as that which are present. During the interview process with survivors of Saidnaya, I too devoted much of my time trying to hear the absence of sound. I was looking for different ways in which to measure the state of enforced silence because I believed that the silence itself constituted a human rights violation. So they were held in total silence. They couldn't make any sound or, or they would face repercussions. Not as it, this silence is not as it functions in isolation cells in the US as an act of torture based on sensory deprivation, but one more closely related to the stress position that they use in Guantanamo Bay. And this is defined as forcing the human body to adopt and remain for great periods of time in static squat positions or equivalent, in which the whole body's weight is borne by just one or two muscles. Likewise, the order of complete silence in Saidnaya is used to restrict prisoners' physical movements to suppress their respiratory functions, because if they cough or scratch an itch, they have to remain completely still, not cough or clear their throats, not stretch or exercise their muscles for the fear of making any sound at all. So silence really kind of like changed the architecture of incarceration. To, to, it shrinks it around them. And attempting to explain to me the silence at Saidnaya, Jamal said that one of the loudest sounds was the killing of lice, whose amplitude, he said, was equivalent to that of crushing a sesame seed between one thumb and forefinger. Train whistle. In confirming the location of CIA black site in central Bucharest, the ear witness testimony of a former detainee was vital due to the fact that he had heard the constant omnidirectional sound of rail traffic bleeding in through the walls. There is in Bucharest a V-shaped conglomerate of network rail interchanges, and at the nadir of this V-shape stood a warehouse, the perfect place for covert operations, as even though it was in the middle of Bucharest and very easy to access logistically, it was completely isolated from the city by the surrounding layers of railway infrastructure. The release in de December 2014 of the US Senate report that finally acknowledged the existence of CIA black sites confirmed that this warehouse was indeed being used as a secret prison as part of the US rendition and torture program. Tray rack. And this is an excerpt from Alistair Cook's account of the shooting of Bobby Kennedy. So excuse the uh, archaic language, you're going to see what I mean in a minute. It was about 18 minutes after midnight. A few of us strolled over the swinging doors that gave on to the pantry. They had no glass peepholes, but we'd soon hear the pleasant bustle of him coming through, as the waiters and the colored chef in his hi-hat and a busboy or two waited to see him. There was suddenly a banging repetition of sound that I don't know how to describe, not at all like gunshots, but more like somebody dropping a rack of trays. Wagon wheel. And this is an excerpt from Rosalind Morris, the miner's ear, who uh, I know about through Vivian and Natasha, who were here um, from their project Landings. And it was a very key text for, for, for me and my thinking. So thanks to Vivian and Natasha for this. The Miner's Ear by Rosalind Morris. On, th on August 3rd, 1964, home of the Huitsens, an Africana family living in a gold mining village in South Africa, disappeared into an enormous subsidence as their home, as their domestic, as, as they and their domestic servant vanished in a cloud of flame and red dust, buried alive in the hole's unreachable depths. Soon thereafter, three other houses fell into the pit, and though their residents managed to escape, those who escaped the collapse of their own houses were able to do so because they interpreted the sound of earth falling as a warning sign and not as a mere symptom. A deafening swoosh or roar some of the survivors had likened to the sound of wagon wheels on a dirt road. But it had been a long time since any wagons had rumbled across this landscape. That sound has a history too, and forms part of the remembered experience of the Great Trek when white settler colonists and their forebears, originally from the Flemish lowlands, traveled inland from the Cape 
in search of a new Jerusalem. Wooden door instrument, another one of uh, the pieces that I constructed for this ear witness inventory. The front door slammed shut, and then there were no more voices, just the dogs. This is what Robert Heistra said he heard when he wa walked his own dogs in a Brentwood alley the night of 12th of June, 1994. Almost all of the ear witnesses, almost all of the ear witness testimony in the trial of O.J. Simpson made remarks about hearing this door slam. The sequence of events in this case were crucial, and so they each relied on a number of ways to pin this closing door sound to other events that punctuate their memories. The flossing of teeth, the time on a ta car's clock, the printed time on a restaurant receipt. Woolen mattress topper. Many of the weapons used to beat detainees of Saidnaya were never seen by victims, only heard and felt. When they heard others being beaten, they would listen to the sound and try to derive from it what kind of instruments were being used. During the interviews with witnesses uh, and myself, I would try to describe and think of ways to create, recreate these sounds in the hope of making a comprehensive account of all of the different weapons being used there. In, again, in the service of trying to document a war crime. Jamal compared one weapon sound to the strike of an iron bar landing on the top of a wooden table. And another made a sound like a leather belt against a plaster wall. Sam's descriptions involve striking a specifically woolen, not foam mattress, while also explaining that they, when they hit the bottom of detainees' feet, it made a sound like hitting a plastic bag filled with cotton. At times, their instructions required the combination of two usually unassociated objects, like when Diab said, I should hit a leather handbag with a willow stick. Other descriptions were drawn from more familiar memories, like when Anas described the specific weapon as making the same sound as when people beat the dust out of their rugs on the balconies in a Damas in a, on a Damascus balcony using wicker carpet beaters. These objects were the materials that they thought best suited to mimic the sound of real weapons, with the implicit understanding that if we had the actual weapons themselves, we could get a more precise reproduction. However, when Jamal and Salam came to describe the sound of the water supply pipe hitting someone in Saidnaya, they explained that getting the exact same weapon and recreating its strike would be inadequate to achieve the sound they remembered it making. It doesn't sound like something hitting a body, Jamal explains. It sounds like someone is demolishing a wall. Salam corroborates, don't just get a plastic pipe and hit someone, you have to get a sledgehammer and smash it against a wall. Then you'll get the exact sound that we heard when they used this weapon. So just again, I interviewed those people totally independently, and both of them come with this idea of the wall, don't worry, it's nearly over. So, um, so, uh, so I'm just saying that when I say that they corroborate one another with, with, with thinking about demolishing a wall, they both came with this exact um, same. Sound. Roulette balloon gun, sesame seeds, silver foil helium, helium balloon, slingshot, sneakers, steel wool stilettos. Yellow flowers. pages, the last entry I will uh, speak about today. In the process of accumulating my own sound effects library specific to the investigation of ear witness testimony, I've come across many descriptions in which ear witness explained the sounds they heard in the negative. It didn't sound like a punch or not at all like gunshots, or it doesn't sound like something hitting a body. These witnesses know what it is they heard. They do not say, I did not hear a punch, but that the punch they heard didn't sound like a punch, meaning the sound that we expect it to make, which is often conditioned by sounds they've heard on TV or in the cinema. Currently, one of the most popular punch sound effects for the screen is created by dropping a phone book to the ground. For many of us whose primary experience of violence is cinematic, this particular punch sound has become what we imagine and expect a real punch to sound like. Yet witnesses to real assaults suggest that punches sound quite different. It didn't sound like a punch, but a lighter being thrown to the ground and popping, said a witness in an Oregon courthouse. While another witness to the same punch said it sounded like the noise of a cinder block falling on concrete. A New Zealand witness said that of a blow that he overheard, it sounded like an egg cracking. And a witness in Hastings, United Kingdom, describe hearing an assault like a watermelon smashing. These are but a few examples I've encountered where witnesses first negate the sound th that they expect to hear, only then to describe the real sound in terms of an alternate imaginary sound effects of their own devising. 
And, and the, the, when I quote them, it is often you, you will hear that they keep repeating the same word. They keep saying watermelon. They keep saying egg over and over and over again to the point where you can no longer ignore the egg or extract the egg from the event itself. Our experience and memories of acoustic violence is com completely convolved with the production of sound effects. To the extent that watermelons, eggs, cinder blocks, leather handbags, a rack of trays, and a cigarette lighter are not simply objects that describe an event, they are themselves the devices by which memories are encoded, stored, recalled, and can be retrieved. Thank you very much. Kolu and Kiewit Fall, Dell Keyboard 2006, Dove and Pigeon Fall, Whistle, Eggs, Empty Cans, Family Size Soft Drink Bottles, Fiberglass Sledgehammer.